Good evening for those of you joining us on YouTube. We are starting a new study tonight on Love Your Church uh, by Tony Morita. Uh, it's a great book. We're going to be in the first chapter tonight talking about belonging. Before we get into it, we are going to uh, show a short introduction video for the chapter tonight. So y'all pay attention and we will come back after it's over with. The Lord Jesus Christ loves the church. His heart is bound up with his church. That is why when Paul was persecuting believers, Jesus asked him, why are you persecuting me? To persecute the church was to persecute Christ. And the reverse is also true, in that to love the church is to love Christ. When you really think about it, being part of the church is thrilling. We are a little embassy of the kingdom of God. We are his household, his body. We are being built into a temple with Christ as the cornerstone. Being part of the church is a joy. But I know that even though you might not say it out loud, many people are not thrilled when it comes to being part of a local church. Maybe you've had a negative experience in the church or not many positive ones, yet Jesus loves it and we can learn to love it too. But what does it actually look like to love your church? Well, over these sessions, we're going to think about eight ways in which you can do just that. The first one that we have in view in this session is belonging. Here's the question. Have you ever wondered why so many television shows revolve around a single small community? Or thought about why social media is so popular? People want to be known and want to know others. God has given us this need for community because he is a relational God and he has made us for relationships. But sin gets in the way, breaking our fellowship with God and with others. But in Christ, we are reconciled to God and to one another. We become part of a new community, the church. God has given us a place where we belong. Now we need to commit to belong to a local church, a particular group of believers in a particular place. This is where we actually live out our union with other believers. We are to belong to a real community of people locally. In this session, you're going to spend some time looking at Paul's letter to the Ephesians, which contains many significant passages about the church. Among other things, it tells us that we are being built together into a temple with Christ as the cornerstone. We are being sanctified, nourished, and cherished by God together. This is what we belong to in our local church. There are obstacles to this kind of belonging. Well, let's be honest about that. But we also belong by grace. And as you go into your discussion, I want to leave you with the thought of uh, the 20th century German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who says, the physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. It is grace and nothing but grace that we are allowed to live in community with Christian brethren. Why don't you take some time to pray before you guys start your discussion? All right. Well, let's do that. Let's pray, and then we will get into our discussion tonight. Father, again, we thank you for this time to come together tonight. We pray that you would bless our study as we open your word, as we look at the importance of belonging, that, God, you have designed us to be a part of community. Uh, you have designed us in your image, and so we are grateful for that. We pray that you bless our time together. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, so tonight, if you have, does everybody have a copy of the discussion guide, or at least one in the book or, or the paper version of it? Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, I will have uh, in the link, uh, a link in the description below that you can access the same discussion guide that we're using for tonight. Uh, but we're going to start off, if you have your Bibles, uh, open up with me to Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm going to ask if I can get a volunteer to read from Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 all the way through chapter 3 verse 19. It's going to be a good little chunk, but we'll read that and then we'll get into it. Somebody willing to read that for us? <laughs> look at look at there. Look at there. Thank you, Miss Faye, for volunteering. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, Carly. Okay, I'm two eighteen. Okay. For though him and we for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, also members of his household. 
built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling which God lives by his spirit. <coughs> for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for the sake of you, Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery that made known by the revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the people in other generations, as, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel of the Gentiles, and heirs together with Israel, members together with one body, and shares together in promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given through, <clears throat> given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me, to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. <clears throat> His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, in according, <clears throat> according to his eternal purposes that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for, which, my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that his glorious riches may strengthen you with the power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and how high and deep the love of Christ is. Yep. That's one more. Is that it? Through 19, yeah. And to know that the love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. All right. So there's a lot of important things. Uh, now I will open into sermon and preach this, and then we will... No, I'm just kidding. Not doing that. Uh, so based on what we just read, there's a lot going on, obviously. So feel free to, to reference back if you've got your Bibles. Uh, feel free to reference back as we walk through this. But uh, what are some things... Uh, that Paul uses to describe the church there? How, how does he describe it? Some different ways. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. What else? That's a very common theme uh, the in the, the body. Church. Christ is the head of the church, yep. What about in, um, in for example, in, in verses 19, oh, just in verse 19, how is it how are we defined there? How's the church defined? So we're no longer foreigners and strangers. Yeah. We're no longer foreigners and strangers. Uh, some of your translations may say aliens there. Uh, we're no longer separated, but instead we're, we're unified. As he says here, we are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. Uh, that's an important distinction. Uh, especially, that's very prevalent in our culture as it relates to uh, political residents, right? You hear that all the time. The, the debate between uh, residents and aliens and these people, the right to citizenship and all of that. Uh, and we make, we make such a big deal about that, right? And that's the forefront of, of our news outlets, regardless of which side of the aisle you fall on. But how much more important is it that we understand our heavenly citizenship, right? That for those of us that are in Christ, we're not Americans first, we are blessed to live in this nation, and we are blessed to have the freedoms that we do. But in Christ, Paul even says there's no longer a distinction between Jew and Greek, slave and free. But the banner that we wave above all else is not the American flag, but our identity in Christ. And he says here that we have gone from being strangers and aliens or foreigners to now being all part of the same nationality in Christ. And that's a beautiful distinction to understand. What else? He goes on uh, continuing together. Uh, verse 21, how does he define us? If you got your Bible. The holy temple. That's right. So as the body of Christ, 
He now defines us as the temple of God. Now, he doesn't explicitly ask us this in the discussion of God, but I want to ask y'all, why is that significant? Why is it significant that he says that as believers we are the temple of God? What's significant about the temple? The Lord resides there. That's right. That's the place where the Lord dwells. You go back and you look through the Old Testament. Uh, before the temple was established, they built the tabernacle. And that was the place where they housed the Ark of the Covenant that represented the presence of God. And nobody could go into that room except for the high priest when he was making atonement for sins. Well, then eventually they would build the temple as the, the permanent structure that would house uh, the Ark of the Covenant representing the presence of the Lord. Still the same idea. No one could go into the Holy Holies except for the high priest. Then in Hebrews, we see that Jesus is the great high priest, that he makes intercession for us. We see when Jesus died on the cross that the veil that separated the rest of the temple from the Holy of Holies was split from top to bottom, signifying that now there's nothing keeping us from the presence of the Lord. And looking at this definition, the fact that we are the temple as believers in Christ, that the Holy Spirit of God now dwells within us. We have become the Holy of Holies inside the temple the place where the Spirit of God dwells. And now we have direct access to God the Father through the blood of Jesus Christ and the indwelling of His Holy Spirit. So that is very significant for us to understand. We don't just worship some, some distant God that we have to go through someone else. He dwells within us now. Uh, there's several other ways that he defines if, as you go on through there. Um, he talks about us, uh, again, being the body. Brandy already mentioned that. Uh, he talks about how he was uh, the least of all the saints, the chief of all sinners, so to speak. Uh, some of your translations may say there. Uh, but if Paul, who was one of the greatest Christians to ever live, who wrote half of our New Testament, if he says he's the chief of all sinners, then we're in pretty good company, right? We're all sinners together. We're all sinners at the foot of the cross, and we're all uh, blessed in that. So uh, with those things that we've talked about our identity, that uh, we are the body of Christ, that we are citizens with the saints, uh, that we are the temple of God. What are some things that he wants us to see about the church's identity in those types of descriptions? Are we like the rest of the world? There's something unique about us, right? Uh, there again, we, we're, we're very quick to raise the banner of uh, the American flag or our political party. Uh, but in all actuality, we should, and I'm not saying we do, we should have more in common with someone who lives, let's just use China for example, someone who lives in China as a Chinese nationalist who is a believer, we should have more in common with them than we do a fellow political party member that lives in this country that's not a believer. And that's, that's an important thing for us to hear, and it, sometimes that's tough, <clears throat> Right? If, if we're just using the example, and I'm just going to throw out the example of being a Republican, we feel like we have, if we're a Republican and that's how we vote, we feel like we have way more in common with another Republican voter that's lost than we do with someone that lives in China that's a believer. And that's not how the Scripture has defined us. What we believe about Christ transcends nationalities. It transcends uh, cultures. It transcends ethnicities. It transcends socioeconomic divisions that Christ is what brings us together. And together, we function as the body of Christ. We function as the temple of God. All right? So Paul's mission uh, was to preach to the Gentiles. He was called the apostle to the Gentiles. He was given the instruction to go to the Gentile world, to go outside of the Jewish culture, which is so interesting because he was a Jew of Jews. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And yet he was called to step outside of his own people uh, what is his ultimate purpose and the purpose of the church uh, as it shows in verses 1 through 13 of chapter 3? What did he say was um, the greatest <clears throat> goal here? You kind of see it starting in verse 3. So make it everybody understand? Or? Yeah. To present the truth of the gospel. He says, he refers to it as the mystery of Christ. 
So what he's talking about is they have the scriptures, and Paul says this in multiple places. He says it when he talks to Timothy. He says it when he talks to Titus. He says it to the Corinthian church. The scriptures are already there. He's using the Old Testament scriptures to share the gospel. So he says everything that you need for, the, for salvation is already there, but there's this cloud, this, this cloud of mystery surrounding it. And Paul is saying, I'm here to connect the dots to help you understand the mystery of Christ, to show here's what was prophesied in God's word, but here's who Jesus is. And here's how he fulfills all that was said. Here's how he fulfills what was written all of these years leading up to it. And look at what he says in verse 8. Why was grace given to him? Eight Verses 8 and 9. That he should preach. That he should preach what? To the Gentiles. Uh-huh. What specifically? The unsearchable riches. That's right. The unsearchable riches, the goodness of who Christ is that was hidden for ages in God who created all things. So he is making known what has previously been hidden. Now, he's not preaching a new gospel, and that's so important to understand. The same thing we talked about in Sermon on the Mount. Jesus didn't change anything. He's <clears throat> revealing what was already there. He's showing you the true meaning that was given when the Old Testament scriptures were written. He's just showing the fullness of it now. Uh, in Colossians, he refers to it as uh, the law was the shadow of things to come, but Christ is the one casting the shadow. Uh, so when you look at the Old Testament, there's this picture of something to come. It's like you see the shadow on the ground. Well, there's something casting that shadow. And in the New Testament, we see that it was Christ standing there the whole time. We could just see the shadow where now we see him. And so there's this beautiful understanding there. All right. Uh, what does Paul pray for his readers in verses 14 through 19? What's his prayer? It says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. What does he pray in, starting in verse 16? Yeah. That Christ might dwell in your hearts. Mm -hmm. Will be rooted and established in love. Yep. So as we as we talk through this, I, I think there's kind of a triage of things that some things we do really well, some things that we need to work on, right? And I'm not saying Bethlehem, I'm saying the, the church at large. Um, pray that he may grant you uh, to be strengthened with power in your inner being. Sometimes we do well with that. Sometimes even if practically we may not, um, it's, it, we can say, hey, I believe the truth of God's word. It gives me strength to stand on. Philippians 4, 8, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Sometimes that's harder in application when we go through difficult times in life. Uh, we don't necessarily go to him first. It's kind of like the last resort. We go through everything else, all the other options, and then we're like, all right, God, I'm here. I'm trusting in you for your strength. Uh, he says that, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Uh, this is not the same as saying I've asked Jesus into my heart, uh, but it's talking about Christ and, and even getting into John 1, the understanding of the Word, uh, the Word of Christ. If, if Christ is the embodiment of the Word, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, that Christ as His Word and the understanding of who He is dwells within our hearts. Uh, as Psalm 119 says, I have hidden your Word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Um, you be rooted and firmly established in love, uh, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what the length and width and height and depth of God's love and to know that his love surpasses knowledge. Uh, that not just Notice that he says not just hear the word of God, not just believe it, but he says to comprehend it, to understand the truth of God's word. Uh, that's Paul's prayer, that the word of God is able for us to comprehend and understand and it changes all of these other aspects in our life. That's very important. Um, why do you think he includes the phrase together with all the Lord's holy people? And how does that change your understanding of his prayer? Uh, verse 18, my translation says, comprehend with all the saints. Uh, some of your translations may say with all the Lord's holy people. What do some of your translations say there? Verse 16. Mine says comprehend. Okay. Uh, 18, sorry, not 16. Did you say the same thing, Ms. Faye? Okay. Uh, why do you think that's important? To comprehend with all the saints. Do we do... Uh, the, which 
I'm going to make this statement. Every Christian, well, every person in the world is a theologian, whether you want to say you are or not. Everybody has a certain belief set about God. All theology is the study of God. It's how we define God, how we understand God. Uh, so with that in mind, do we do theology in a bubble individually or do we do it collectively with the church? It's a trick question. I'm acknowledging it's a trick question. <laughs> yeah, it is both, right? So do we study God's word and develop understanding on our own? Absolutely, we should be, right? He's called us to, to have a relationship with him, to understand. Uh, but how do we make sure that we're on the right track? How do we make sure that we're not off in left field coming up with something that's not accurate with Scripture? We, we study together, right? We do it in community. We come together as a church. Uh, and, and there are some people that they know much more about God's Word. There's some people that are still growing in God's Word. And I'm going to be honest with you. If I'm sharing it with y'all, I can promise you I didn't just come up with it. I have read it. I've studied it. i talked with other people. I have three different pastors specifically on speed dial that I talk to at least one, if not all three of them, every single week. And we bounce ideas off of each other and we talk theology, making sure that, hey, we're not coming up with stuff. And just as a side note here, if you ever hear somebody say, I came up with something brand new out of God's Word that nobody's ever found before, run. <laughs> run. I can promise you of the 2,000 years of Christian church history, there's nothing brand new. There may be things that we draw more out of, that we build on, but there's nothing brand new. Uh, we've got a pretty good establishment. And I would say a lot of the heresies that are coming up in today's society are because people have not studied what the great leaders have found ahead of us. They've already done the work. Let's just build off of that. Let's continue to grow and, and, and use the work they've done. We don't have to reinvent the wheel as it relates to our Christianity. But Paul makes it clear here, there is an importance of comprehending together, that we work together to understand the truth of God's word. Uh, and you see, as he says here, how does that change your understanding of his prayer? Paul's prayer is not that we're just doing Bible study individually, that we're sitting at home. And I've heard this so many times as a pastor. Well, I don't need the church. I've got my Bible. I can sit at home. I can read it, and I can get just as much out of it. Well, if that were true, you would see the importance of gathering together with the saints and not neglecting them, as is the habit of some, but comprehending together with all the saints the length and width and depth of God's love. So, therefore, the, seeing this, this mindset coming together helps hold us accountable. It helps make sure that we are actually learning God's word as he intended it. We get to help one another and correct one another when we, when we miss things a little bit. Uh, and I am grateful for those pastors in my life because there's times where I'm like, hey, this is what I'm reading. This is how I think. This is, this is what I think it's saying. Help me make sure. And they're like, no, nah, man, you missed that. Uh, another good tool for you in your personal Bible study is commentaries. And again, we've talked about this as we talked about studying the Bible. Commentaries are not our primary source, but they are good sounding boards after we read the text and we kind of come up with, is this what God's saying? If we read the commentaries and they're all kind of saying what we came up with, we're probably on a good track there, right? But if all the commentaries are saying something different, then we may need to go back and reevaluate what we came up with, right? The same is true in the context of the church, and the church is vitally more important than those commentaries are. Uh, so in our church, he says in your church, in our church, what does it look like to commit and to belong? What does it mean to commit and to belong to Bethlehem Baptist Church? I think you'd be involved. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> a novel idea, right? To be involved. Yeah. It's be hard to commit to something. <laughs> Do what? Be on a committee. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey. Or two. Careful now. Careful now. Yep. What about to belong? More than just committing, what does it mean to belong to Bethlehem Baptist Church? To participate. To care about and take care of. Yeah. There, it's, it's more than just like a contractual obligation. There's a genuine care there, right? That when one of us is struggling with something, we're, we got your back, right? To know that if I'm going through a either a great time or a tough time, I got people that are going to be there with me. So in our case, we just had a baby, right? 
the way this church rallied around us and encouraged us and gave us food. And I mean, that's an incredible encouragement. I think about with uh, Mr. Daryl and Miss Gail and what they've been going through the last few months, having a church that's there to pray for them, to help them out, to, to be there to support. That's what we do as a church. And we're not going to be perfect in that, unfortunately. But we want to try our best to, to make our members know that they are cared for, that they do belong, that we're not just are we, are we asking them to commit to us, but that we're committing to them as well. And we're committing to one another. How can we encourage one another to do this better? So, for example, those that we see that are not necessarily committed, that are not belonging right now, how can we encourage them to do so? Be an example to them, yeah. Love them. Love them. We got a very real example of this, right? We just put out the, uh, the list of active and inactive members, right? So we have a very real list of people who are on our membership roster, but somehow they've slipped through the cracks. And so one way we, we're not going to help them commit and feel belonged is to call and berate them. You ain't been here. You're a terrible person. What are you? That's not how that works. But just like y'all said, to, to be that example, to love on them, to make them know, hey, we miss you. Yeah, we want you here with us. That goes a long way. The way that we present truth goes a long way. It's one thing to say, you ain't been here in a while. You need to be here. Is that true? Yes. Is that the right way to say it? No, they won't ever come back, <laughs> right? But to present it in a loving and caring way to say, hey, we miss you and we love you. It's a big difference. Uh, what's the danger in not belonging to a specific local congregation? Yeah, that's a big one. There's no accountability. And I would, I would change that question just a bit to say belonging to a biblical and godly local congregation. Uh, there are some churches in our area that I'm not going to publicly state their names, but there are some churches that uh, it is possible to be a member of those churches uh, and to, for there to be no accountability, whether you're there or not. They have no clue if you're there. Uh, it's all about how you feel when you leave. Do you feel encouraged? Do you feel happy? And if that's the case, then they've succeeded for the week. There's never going to be cases of church discipline where sin is addressed within the life of the church. There's never going to be those phone calls of, hey, I hadn't seen you in a year. What's going on? How can I pray for you? Uh, not that they don't necessarily care, but they just don't keep up with those kind of things. Uh, and so there's, there's a very danger in that. Uh, I've, I've even thought about this uh, in our own personal lives, going through difficulty. We, we talked about suffering with one another. Uh, I can't imagine going through life, losing a loved one, having to go through a funeral, having to go through difficult times in life, whatever it is, and not having a church family to be there for us. Uh, I think about when I've had family members that have passed away, how much our church families have been there to rally around us, to support us, and to encourage us in that. Uh, now, we're, thank we're, we're very blessed. We have multiple church families that have come alongside us. You know, Memphis being my home church that I grew up in, that my parents are still members in, they still check on us to see how we're doing uh, because they love us. Cloverdale is where Elizabeth grew up. Her parents are still involved there. They still check on us to make sure. I've never been a member at Cloverdale, but Cloverdale, several times, people have asked me how we're doing, how the Lord is working in our ministry. And obviously, being here at Bethlehem, uh, the way that the church surrounds us. And that's the beauty of knowing uh, and, and the danger of not belonging to that congregation is you don't have that accountability. You don't have that support. Uh, it's, it's like inviting Satan to be your closest friend. Yeah. Because he's going to be there. Absolutely. You know, and if you don't have a church family to counter that, Absolutely. it's, it's a lot tougher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, what are some things that we can pray? Uh, based on this passage, what we see here, how can we pray uh, for our church? I think we can start by praying for that list of folks that haven't been here. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. For I, I, unity. For unity, yeah, absolutely. 
uh, I think a good thing is to just follow Paul's example uh, where he gives that example of his prayer for the church. Now he's praying for the church in Ephesus, uh, but to pray these things that he prays for them, that the Lord would grant Bethlehem Baptist Church the riches of his glory, that Bethlehem would be strengthened with power uh, through the Spirit of God, and that Christ would dwell in the hearts of Bethlehem Baptist Church through faith, that Bethlehem Baptist Church would be rooted and firmly established in love, uh, that Bethlehem would be able to comprehend with all of the saints, not just this body, but all of the saints, with the churches in our community that we partner with, uh, that we would know the length and width and height and depth of God's love, and uh, that we would know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's a really great prayer for us to pray, right? Uh, and that's there again. We don't, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to come up with new things. There are specific things that we can pray related to Bethlehem Baptist Church, sure. But there are some really great prayers in Scripture by some really godly folks that have already given us that example uh, to be able to pray this for one another. Uh, and so as we close out, we're going to take some time to pray through that. Uh, but now I want to get into some, some fun questions. Uh, if you got the, the worksheet there, you'll see it there on the, the belonging page. Um, how did Bethlehem Baptist Church get started? Was it? Okay. What else? Yep. I actually did a little bit of homework uh, this week because I, I like church history. I like broad church history, and I like local church history too. Um, apparently, this this particular history that is that several folks put together has a typo in it because it, and there's some dispute on when the actual originating date of the church was. This says 1886. There are some reports that it was 1894. But the side of the building out here says 1896. So um, because it's on the building, that's the one we're going to go with. <laughs> it's, it's actually set in stone out there. Um, but 1896, regardless, in the late 1800s, this church was established. Um, and, and actually, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, but it says that there was a group of people that assembled for the purpose of starting a church four miles east of Headland, Alabama, Bethlehem Baptist Church, by the grace of God, has prospered ever since. The first meetings were held under a brush arbor uh, with Brother Bud White leading the worship services once a month. We're not going back to that. We're going, we're going to keep meeting once a week. Uh, but I find it neat, too, to see how over time church uh, has adapted, right? Uh, uh, that we've, we've gone from that to, to meeting every week. Uh, it says here, uh, Mr. S.D. Farmer donated the land for a building to be erected, and Mr. Sammy Yance gave lumber from timber on his land. A one-room structure was built, and worship services were held there for many years. Uh, and then it gives a list of some of the early pastors, some of the early people. Uh, in the 20s, uh, they added Sunday school classes here at Bethlehem in the 1920s. So uh, the roaring 20s were roaring for the church, too. Uh, and a Baptist Young People's Union was begun uh, in 1930. Tornado tore down the church, uh, tore down the building that they had here. And so they rebuilt it. Um, in the 40s, you had World War II coming along. Uh, and that was when a lot of things were added to the church. Uh, the, the Baptist Young People's Union was reorganized. Uh, later that became Training Union, eventually Discipleship Training. Uh, women's a WMU group was organized and educational rooms were added to the rear of the one room structure for more Sunday school classes uh, in the 50s they outgrew the building that they had and they needed to build a new one and membership at that point both active and inactive was 280 people now how many were actually coming uh, we have records of that Mr. Billy Wayne was telling me he has those records but didn't know them off the top of his head uh but it would be interesting to see the percentage of active versus inactive then versus now. Because now, what did we say we had? Just over 600 on the membership roster? Is that right? It was like 
160, yeah. 460. 160, yeah. 160 active and 460 something inactive at the current moment. Uh, and this is big right here. Uh, in the 60s, oh, well, I'm sorry, back in the 50s, uh, they added on to the, uh, they built a new building, had 10 educational rooms, a nursery, a pastor study, two bathrooms, a utility room, a kitchen, recreation room, and a new auditorium complete with a baptistry and a choir loft. That was right here. That was uh, 1957 is when they moved into it. Uh, that and, was all in that building. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then in the 60s, 1967, they added heating and cooling. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And we were talking about that earlier, and, and, and Mr. Billy Wayne said, and they've been replaced multiple times since then. <laughs> um, in the 70s, uh, they had to build on because they didn't have enough room. Uh, they, they added on to the sanctuary, uh, new baptistry. In the 80s, Brother Bob Pemberton came in 1981 as the pastor. Uh, they started the Bethlehem Star during the 80s, and we still have that going on today. Uh, and then... In the 90s, uh, when Brother Norman came to be the pastor here, uh, this is when this particular piece was written. Uh, at that point, there had been 121 years of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Headland community, and we've added on to that since then. And so it's really neat to see that, that Bethlehem is, is the oldest Baptist church in this area. Uh, it's actually older from what I have heard. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. It's actually older than First Baptist was. Is that, am I correct in that? I, I thought I heard that. Because I was told that like okay. yeah. a certain group of people left Bethlehem yep. to start First Baptist. I may be wrong, but yep. that's what I was told. They started Trinity. They did start oh, okay. Trinity, yeah. Okay. The, but that was not, that was the, the old school Southern Baptist Church plant, right. which means there was a split. <laughs> right. It was not an actual plant, it was a split. Uh, the church plant three miles down the road. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, but yes, so. So that's, that's neat to know about our history, uh, looking at some of the things that have changed significantly. We talked about some of that, uh, that this church has been a pillar in this community for so long uh, that we have uh, had such great ministry for almost a century and a half now uh, that we're looking at, that the Lord has been faithful to use this church. Um, who leads the church now? Sometimes I ask myself the same question. Uh, no, uh, we're grateful, grateful to be here. Uh, Aaron, Brother Aaron here as well. Uh, as we talked about Sunday, we've got a great group of deacons uh, that, that lead in serving this congregation. Uh, so here's, here's something I would want to know from y'all. Who are some folks that have been here for a long time and have stories that you'd love to hear? All the hands. Yeah, they've been here a long time. Well, one of the things it says here, too, this is interesting. Um, in the 20s, uh, Brother DeShazo, it doesn't say first name, but it says some of the pastors of the 20s were Brothers DeShazo, Dixon, Culpepper, and Dr. Preston. So to know that Mickey DeShazo's family has been a part of this church even from the 20s, from the earliest days of the church. Uh, so Mr. Mickey would be one of those. Uh, y'all been here a while. How long have y'all been members here? Oh. Do you remember? Ever since Carol was born and raised here wow. in this church. How about that? How long have y'all been here, Miss Faye? <laughs> I think I was, I was at the King of Christian at six, but I thought this is the only church I've ever been to. Yeah. How about I that? I was nine when I became a Christian. How about that? But uh, this is the only church. Yeah. I mean, this is home. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and it, it is neat, too, to see the generational membership at Bethlehem. How many folks that have been here, like you said, the Hams, you know. and uh, Now that's not to say that they're any more special of members, but there is that neat piece that their family was involved in some of the history that we can, uh, we can learn these pieces and keep it you know, accurate and updated. Uh, so, and this is more of, of just a thing to think about, who are you regularly connecting with in our church family? Uh, not just the people that you've known forever, but even building new relationships. You know, we've had a lot of new families join over the last year. Uh, I know there have been more that joined even past that. 
and even as we said reaching outside of the walls who are we bringing into the family uh, again we're not necessarily trying to invite lost people to the church they're always welcome to come but our goal is that we're going out sharing the gospel that people are responding to the gospel and we're bringing them into the family to be a part of the church uh, and so uh, hopefully that's that's an encouragement to y'all uh, if you would like i would be happy to make some copies of this church history it's one of the in one of the old directories Paul made a copy of it for me today, but I'll be happy to make some copies of that for y'all if y'all like them. Uh, but what questions do y'all have as we as we wrap up tonight about belonging, being a part of this family, being a part of of, of Bethlehem Baptist Church? Uh, we talked last week a little bit about things that we love, but uh, and even some things we can do better. Uh, but any questions? If you have obviously on YouTube, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section. Uh, but we're going to wrap up here in the room. See if anybody has any questions. Uh, but one of the things this past year when we went through the campaign yeah. not being able to come to church mm -hmm. was a big I mean you know it was just it was hard yeah. and that has done such a good job of showing how important the church is in the life of a believer uh, you see so many that a lot of those people on that inactive list have been a direct result of COVID some of that has been for good reasons and I'm, I'm not discrediting those at all uh, but some of those you see the the commitment level there previously that it, it it was hanging on the balance and then a pandemic comes along and then there's no desire to come back uh, and there's there's been I've heard a lot of pastors talk about a great winnowing of the church uh, separating wheat from chaff in this context uh, but also it's shown how important it is for those of us that have had a desire to be here that have have strived every chance that we've gotten as we've been able to uh, to come together as it was appropriate uh, has been so important and even uh, John MacArthur's church out in Riverside California uh, the city was shutting them down saying that you cannot meet and they said yes we can and they continued to meet and the city started finding them every single week that they met and they went up suing the city saying that we have to meet. We are called by God to gather as his people and to worship. You can find us all you want to, but we're going to keep meeting. And they wound up suing the city and won a multi-million dollar lawsuit because the city didn't have the constitutional right to stop them from gathering. Uh, now, that's not always going to be the case. And that's not the case around the world. But at least for now, the law is still on our side and allowing us to gather in that sense. And so... Uh, Great encouragement there to see how important the life of the church is for us as believers, uh, to have that sense of belonging. All right? Well, let me, let me pray for us, and then we will close out for tonight. We are finishing on time, too. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you have allowed us to be a part here at Bethlehem Baptist Church. Uh, God, we thank you for, for a wonderful church. Not a perfect church. God, there's no such thing. As long as there are imperfect people that make up the membership of the church, there will never be a perfect church. But God, we thank you that you have called us to this church. We thank you for the brothers and sisters that you have surrounded us with, that when we go through these difficult times, uh, we, can, we can suffer together. God, when we go through the great and exciting times, we can celebrate together. Even as you tell us in your word in 1 Corinthians 12, when one of us suffers, we all suffer. When one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. God, you have given us a family to belong to. You have adopted us into this family. Uh, God, it has nothing to do with where we were born or where we come from or who our mama or daddy was. God, it has everything to do with you, this new birth, not of flesh uh, and blood, but of the Spirit. So, God, we rejoice in that. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here at Bethlehem Baptist Church, uh, and I pray that we would, we would do well to continue to live out the calling that you've placed on our lives, uh, to help encourage those that are not committed, those who don't feel like they belong, uh, that we would draw them in at, through the power of your Holy Spirit. You would partner. We would partner with you. God, we would, we would work alongside the work that you're doing, and we thank you that, you get, that we get to be a part of what you're doing. So we love you and we thank you, and we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.